Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be doing uh, this this lecture first. Um, uh, this is uh, I'm Raj. I'm one of the first year fellows. Uh, I'll be talking on updates from the GINA report that came out in October of 2020. Uh, Dr. Bradley helped me out, going through the slides with me, told me uh, what to include. Um, and let's get going. So I have no disclosures. Um, just to go over the, the issue of guidelines versus the report, GINA specifically states that this is a comprehensive global strategy. And the updates are usually based on two semi-annual literature reviews uh, by asthma clinicians and other researchers around the world. They've actively come out and said that this isn't a guideline. Uh, that uh, clinicians and healthcare professionals should use uh, guidelines and national regulations as per that pertains to their patients in their locality. So the there are another set of guidelines that came out in December of 2020 uh, by the National Heart and Lung Blood uh, Institute that address six questions. Uh, so there is some overlap, but uh, they focus on six specific questions. Uh, that they addressed, uh, whereas Gina was a little bit more comprehensive in their report. So uh, topics that I'll cover today, uh, tools in uh, confirming asthma, the role of uh, exhaled nitric oxide, optimizing inhaler therapy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, lubotriene receptor uh, antagonists and uh, the role of LAMA uh, in treatment of asthma, and then the non-PH2 uh, phenotype of asthma, what therapeutic modalities uh, are available for that. Um, uh, I've, I didn't cover anything in terms of biologics. We've already had a few lectures on them and that's a, almost an hour long topic in itself. So basic definitions of asthma comes uh, from the Greek word that is short for uh, short drawn breath or panting. It's a heterogeneous disease. It's usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation and there's some degree of variable expiratory flow with reversibility um, and characterized by varying symptoms over time. And the pathophysiology is really uh, characterized by uh, increased tonicity of smooth airway uh, cells. Uh, there's hypertrophy of the smooth muscle, uh, leading to hyperresponsiveness, airway remodeling, and uh, mucus hypersecretion. And this is an overview of all the uh, areas of comments that uh, GINA guidelines made or GINA report made in 2020. Uh, we'll go over um, uh, all of them in detail, uh, but some of the things that didn't change is the criteria for establishing diagnosis of asthma. Uh, that stayed the same pretty much throughout uh, the previous updates as well. So the diagnosis of asthma, uh, briefly, it starts off with the history. So uh, usually things that we'll, we'll look for is wheezing and shortness of breath. Um, with variability of symptoms with intensity over time. Uh, we'll look for uh, symptoms getting worse overnight or nighttime awakening. Uh, other things like viral infections and exercise uh, and allergen to cold air can trigger it as well. Certain things that'll move you away from uh, asthma is uh, an isolated cough in adults usually will not be indicative of asthma or chest pain will not be indicative. Uh, the gene updates also mentioned inspiratory ronchi in itself usually pushes you away from um, the diagnosis of asthma or uh, chest pain or shortness of breath associated with paresthesias or lightheadedness uh, is usually not associated with asthma. So the first step is clinical um, suspicion of asthma. The second step is to establish confirmatory diagnosis. And we can do this a number of ways. One is the traditional way of looking for bronchodilatory response on spirogram. We look for an increase in FEV1 of 12% and a 200 milliliter increase um, in the force expiratory volume. Uh, the other that I thought was interesting is that if there isn't an improvement, you could also do a spirogram, start the patient on here, build cortical steroid therapy and see if there's a response in four weeks. Uh, peak expiratory flow is fairly variable. Um, and uh, unless patient's very compliant and very cooperative, it's somewhat difficult to do. Um, and then positive bronchial challenge, we'll go over uh, bronchial provocation tests. And these have been fairly helpful um, in establishing the diagnosis um, of asthma. So the question is why confirm the diagnosis of asthma? Why can't we just use clinical suspicion, put the patient on inhalers and follow up from there on in? And 
this came from a study done in Canada where they looked at patients who were clinically diagnosed with asthma and tried to do confirmatory tests via spirometry or bronchopification tests or just weaning them off their inhalers. And they found up to 30% of patients were able to be either weaned off their uh, inhaler completely or with bronchopropagation tests or tube spirometry, they were given a different diagnosis other than asthma. So about one in three patients who are diagnosed in asthma in primary care clinics may potentially have a, a diagnosis that's not asthma. So the type of bronchopropagation tests, we have the direct provo uh, bronchopropagation tests, uh, mostly the methacholine and histamine challenge tests. We do the methacholine challenge tests here. Uh, and this usually is binding to the M3 receptor and causes airway smooth muscle contraction. Um, and it tests for airway hyperreactivity, which is a key feature of asthma. Negative tests usually make asthma unlikely. Positive tests can still be, if you can have a false positive in about 4.5% of US uh, healthy volunteers. The indirect uh, tests are a variety of them. The most common one is the exercise of the hypertonic saline test, but the manifold test is available now as well. This is usually um, airway um, uh, hyperreactivity is brought on by changing osmolarity of the airway. That causes inflammatory cells to release bronchoconstrictive mediators, and that'll end up causing bronchoconstriction. It's a little bit more specific for asthma than the direct bronchopropagation uh, test. Okay, so, which of the following concerning bronchopropagation tests is most accurate? A, exercise testing is more accurate than methacholine challenge testing for making the diagnosis of asthma. A positive methacholine challenge test accurately separates asthma from COPD. A negative methacholine challenge test has excellent negative predictive value in ruling out a diagnosis of asthma in symptomatic patients. Inhaled cortical steroid usage does not affect sensitivity of the tests. See? Okay. It's it. <laughs> hey, so I got it. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll go over this. So indication and contraindication for bronchopropagation tests. So uh, we can use it for occupational asthma, uh, confirming or excluding the diagnosis in high-risk populations, uh, especially patients um, who have uh, are unable to take uh, uh, love of and short-acting beta agonists. And chronic cough with a normal spirometry may be helpful for that as well. Uh, there are certain contraindications. Uh, if the FEV1 is less than 60%, uh, in exercise uh, bronchopropagation tests, it's less than 75%. Uh, if the patient is unable to perform spirometry, then the prov uh, provocation test is not very useful. And the other is cardiovascular problems. So in the last three months, if they've had an MIRCDA or if they have uncontrolled hypertension or known aortic aneurysm, and eye surgery that may lead to increase in cranial pressure. And the rationale behind this is that the bronchoprovocation test can suddenly increase blood pressure. So that can precipitate uh, ischemic events or increase in cranial pressure. So the methacholine challenge test um, uh, guidelines came out in 2017 in the European Respiratory Journal uh, about how to standardize them across the board. And they're now recommending using a dose as opposed to a concentration. So the dose usually begins from a one to three microgram dose, or you can do it in micromillimoles. Um, micromoles, sorry. And we double or quadruple the dose at each interval. Um, let the patient breathe at least for a minute in between um, uh, spirometry and nebulization. Uh, and then we'll stop it if there's a 20% decrease in FEV1 or we reach the maximum dose. So there, Certain medications that patients are on for asthma will interfere with the bronchopropagation tests. Uh, of these, um, long-acting muscarinic agents can last almost up to a week. So you should try to ask patients to stop some of their medication at least the night before. The llama uh, may be in their system for a week, so certain of these tests may be uninterpretable if they're already on um, their inhaler therapy. So this is what we use here. Uh, on the left, we'll have the concentration of the doses. Uh, so it goes from, we'll start at uh, 0.06 and it will go all the way up to 16 milligrams per millimeter. Now, the new guidelines recommend that we, we, we don't use concentration, we actually use the actual dose. So either in micromoles or micrograms, so up to 400 micrograms. Um, just the, and the rationale behind that is that um, 
each institution uses a different way of concentrating the, the methylcholine, uh, and that can cause variations in the total dose administered. So if we just convert it to a standard dose, it's easier to uniformly interpret it across uh, different institutions. So um, any takers on if the, the methylcholine challenge report on the right is positive or negative? I mean, it, it's given at the bottom, but um, the patient was able to achieve maximal dose and there was only a 6% change in baseline. Um, sorry, uh, a 6% change in baseline and so that excludes it, so you have to have a 20% drop at the D1. Okay. And this is the, the new way of how they standardize uh, the dosing for the methylcholine challenge. So we go uh, on the left, we use now use provocative dose as opposed to concentration. So what we do here, we'll go from less than 0.25 milligrams per millimeter all the way up to 16. Whereas a provocative dose, we'll do it in terms of micrograms. So we'll go all the way up to 400 micrograms um, and start to, uh, or micrograms. Uh, if you give up, get up to 400 micrograms and there's no change, it's a negative test. A drop in 20% of FEV1 is considered a positive. If it's um, between 100 to 400 micrograms, it's considered borderline. And if it's less than 25 micrograms, it's considered significant airway hyperreactivity. Um, if the patient develops signs of asthma and there's a drop of 10% in FEV1, you can consider repeating the tests in a couple of months. Uh, studies have shown that in these patients who are in this range between that there's only 10% drop, follow-up um, at the polling challenge in a couple of months will have 25% of the patient that will have a full positive um, at the polling challenge test. Okay. So, so does a, rule, does a positive methylcholine challenge test rule in asthma? The short answer is no. Um, there are other uh, diseases that can cause uh, a positive methylcholine test. And we'll have 5% false negative in um, healthy volunteers as well. So COPD, cystic fibrosis, allergic rhinitis, uh, recent upper airway infections or irritants or some ILDs and inflammatory bowel disorders uh, can cause a positive methylcholine challenge test as well. So compared to, um, uh, we'll look at indirect bron um, bronze provocation tests, but the um, direct uh, test will evaluate for airway hyper-responsiveness. So a negative test is very good in ruling out asthma, a positive test, not so much. So it's more of a sensitive test than it is a specific test. And if there's a drop in 10% of FEV1, uh, consider repeat testing in about two to three months and 25% of those patients who are in the intermediate range will Turn out positive. turn out to be positive. So, and then um, a negative test when you consider alternative factors. So, indirect uh, bronchial provocation tests. There are a variety of them. Um, we end up doing uh, uh, exercise testing here, uh, but there is manifold testing and hypertonic saline available on the market. And then some of the other ones are available as well. Okay, this one is from Chess C. Um, a 20 year old college student comes to your office reporting a dry cough following exercise. He used a friend's asthma inhaler and it stated that it did not help. Lung exam and spirometry are normal. A mannitol inhalation tablet study is initiated, which result, with results shown below. Based on the study, which of the following do you conclude? So, if we look at this, uh, the drop here from baseline is for one is 3.3, .3, and then it drops. 10, the 10% 10 drop is from baseline, and then the last dose, there's a 16.7% drop. So, positive, negative. Stan, you're on the next. He has a negative mantle inhalation test? So, you could go up to a total dose of 435 in total. Uh, but it's 120 that you'll end up going. Um, it's it's not it's not the same as methylcholine. We'll go over it. Um, okay, any takers on it? So he has a positive methylcholine. It's close. Uh, so the man <laughs> so mannitol is an indirect stimulus as opposed to methylcholine, and this causes airway surface osmolarity to change. That'll cause mast cell activation, and that'll release inflammatory mediators. 
and that'll cause constriction of the airways in the muscle cells, leading to bronchoconstriction. So it's delivered in a dry powdered form, and it's a standard protocol all across. So the dosing um, that we were talking about, it goes from 0, 10, 20, 40, 80, 160, 160, and 160. So it's a total of 635. And what you end up doing is you increase the dose unless you have a 10% fall or zone. And when there's a 10% fall, then you repeat the dose that you gave. So that's what they did. The previous dose is repeated. And 15% for mannitol as opposed to 20% for methacholine until you get to 635. So this is good for exercise-induced uh, bronchoconstriction and allergic asthma. Less set of time and equipment, and then yeah, fifteen percent drop in FTV one from baseline, or ten percent drop between doses, and then you just repeat it. Um, it has good specificity um, in subjects who aren't taking inhaled corticosteroids, uh, and healthy controls can get a cough, but they usually won't uh, respond to the max dose. So if we go back to if we go back here, um, patient got five, ten, twenty, twenty. So at the twenty milligram dose, there was a ten percent drop from baseline. So at that point, you'll repeat the dose, and then you see 16%, which is greater than 15% cost in baseline. So you have positive mannitol exchange. So the indirect challenge tests are a little bit more specific, whereas the methacholine challenge tests or the direct ones are um, more sensitive. Um, they correlate a little bit better um, with inflammation and are a little bit more predictive of anti-inflammatory response to treatment. Um, so when it comes to exercise bronchospasm, they're probably the best choice um, uh, testing. So for patients uh, who are playing sports or for the military, a manifold test might be an alternative to uh, cold air or exercise. Okay. So what about pheno? Um, can we use it to diagnose asthma? Yeah, kind of. Uh, uh, so we'll start off. Uh, an adult patient with asthma is referred for uh, evaluation, which is the correct, which is correct with respect to measurement of exhaled nitric oxide concentration in the setting. Specific biomarker for mast cell airway inflammation, sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of asthma, correlates weakly with the degree of obstruction. This degree, let's see, C is correct. So phenol production um, is considered. Um, mediated by TH2, and the main cytokine is IL-13. Eosinophil some will contribute to um, the production of nitric oxide as well, but the predominant cytokine, uh, that's the inflammatory mediator that leads to nitric oxide, is um, IL-13. So any takers on what IL uh, sorry, what nitric oxide does in the lungs? <coughs> So in asthmatic specs, it's paradoxical. At low levels, it's vasodilatory, but at higher levels, it can cause vasoconstriction. So that's the underlying thought about how phenol correlates with um, P2 inflammation. So derived from nitric oxide in space and respiratory cells, it's thought specifically due to P2 inflammation. And it's a paradoxical response we talked about. At low concentrations, um, it's vasodilatory, but causes basic constriction at higher concentrations. And it correlates somewhat with eosinophil eosinophilic airway inflammation. So phenol in itself can be decreased or increased by other agents. So uh, taking steroids or smoking will cause it to, to go down. Um, Anti-IL-13 and anti-PSLP, which are experimental um, drugs right now, um, uh, can cause uh, the phenol levels to go down. Uh, atopic conditions can cause it to go up, and then rhinovirus will cause it to go up, um, but res respiratory syncytial virus will cause it to go down. Um, so there's a modest association with uh, sputum eosinophils, which are somewhat difficult to get, uh, but it correlates somewhat better with blood eosinophils, and um, it's higher in patients who are characterized by type 2 inflammation, uh, and it can be normal in neutrophilic asthma. So it hasn't really been um, established in ruling in or out uh, asthma, but it probably could be used as an adjunct in patients who can't perform spirometry, um, and also in patients who might be steroid responsive. Um, 
uh, in those patients, a phenol might be useful um, in, in starting them on um, inhaler therapy. So uh, certain specifics on it, if you have less than 25 parts per billion, um, that's usually inconsistent with T2 inflammation, and it suggests a diagnosis other than asthma, but it could still be neutrophilic asthma in that case, uh, or if the patient's on steroids. If it's over 50 parts per billion, it usually corresponds well with um, T2 inflammation and can, can support a diagnosis of asthma, and these patients will respond to corticosteroids. Uh, but you run trouble if it's between 25 to 50 parts per billion, in which case it, does, it provides very little information. Uh, so the sensitivity is about 80%, specificity about 77%, and then there's a likelihood ratio of 12 to 9, at 12.25. Um, so it can be used as a point of care testing. Um, the allergy clinic at Columbus has it, uh, but it's not for, uh, utilized a whole lot there. Um, uh, it's rapid. It can be done when the patient comes in. Um, it's fairly uh, inexpensive from what I've been told, uh, and it's relatively easy to use. Uh, but it, because of its inability to clearly define asthma, it hasn't been been utilized, but it might start being utilized more and more um, in primary care clinics that don't have spirometry. So um, conclusions about pheno, uh, driven by type 2 inflammation, mostly by IL-13. It's fairly quick and easy to do. Um, it can be used as an adjunct to diagnose mm -hmm. asthma. We should try to test it at uh, the lowest steroid dose, as steroids will decrease the, the level of pheno. And it probably can identify patients with poor outcomes. Uh, and it sometimes used as a predictive response to certain biologics. So pheno is one of the categories that you can use to start a patient on a biologic. Okay. Um, so the goal of um, asthma management for Dina is one, to improve symptoms, and the other is to reduce exacerbations. Uh, over this, so the way uh, Gina proposed looking at uh, symptom control is to go over four questions about daytime asthma symptoms, nighttime awakenings, use of Saba, and any activity limitation. And if there's one or two uh, or more of these symptoms, then you're either partly controlled or uncontrolled. And that's what you'll use to step up therapy to bring, bring the patient down to well control. And this is what we'll usually use um, to initiate therapy based on control. So um, if the patient has symptoms less than twice a month, We'll use you step one. If it's more than twice a month, but not daily, step two. If it's any nighttime awakening, they'll usually put you to step three. Uh, if it's most days of, uh, uh, of uh, you're using your inhaler therapy or you're having nighttime awakening um, more than once uh, uh, a week, you're already step four and step five beyond that. And then retroactively, you'll look at assessing the uh, asthma severity. So mm -hmm. the initial symptoms will give you your step up medication and then uh, seeing how the patients do, you'll classify them as mild asthma or moderate asthma. So if they're well controlled onto step one and step two, they'll be categorized as mild. Uh, step three is considered moderate and beyond that is considered uh, severe. So if you're at step four or five and there's high high dose um, ICS lava uh, to prevent yourself from being uncontrolled, then you're considered to have severe asthma. So it's usually retrospective. Uh, once you start the patient on inhaler therapy, see what they require to be well controlled, we'll give you an assessment of how severe their asthma is. So other factors uh, to look in beyond uh, 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 symptom control is issues such as how often are they using their SABA. So um, there's an increased mortality if you're using more than one canister per month uh, of your SABA. Um, if you're not using your ICS, or if you're not prescribed ICS, uh, or if you have poor inhaler technique, GERD, chronic rhinositis, uh, rhinositis, uh, rhinosinusitis, obesity, and even pregnancy um, can cause, um, it can put you at a higher risk of an asthma or exacerbation. If you've ever been intubated um, or had more than one severe asthma exacerbation per year, you're at a higher risk uh, regardless of whether you're well controlled or uncontrolled. So the issue of um, risk of mild asthma. So some patients who have intermittent symptoms occasionally use their inhaler. Um, studies have looked at it that about uh, 30 to 37 percent of those patients will end up in the ER. Um, or there's a study looking at patients who had 
um, a mild asthma, but yeah, a third of them will have an, um, an ER visit. And so you looked at um, these patients and they had less than one sim weekly symptom the last three months. Um, and the uh, triggers were var variable in terms of allergens or upper respiratory tract infections. Um, and despite data proving otherwise, they've inhaled SABA has been the first line of treatment for the last 50 years. But SABAs in himself have had an adverse effect. Uh, back in 2002, there was an article looking at um, sudden cardiac death in patients with both asthma and COPD. And the higher use of short acting beta agonists and also long acting beta agonists in isolation had a higher risk of sudden cardiac death. It was twofold considered uh, compared to other patients who were on ICF. And based on that, the guidelines um, have changed now that SABA is no longer, SABA only is no, is no longer the first step of treatment. You always add ACS containing uh, inhaler therapy. Uh, and the issue was, well, should we look at inflammatory phenotyping before we start the patient on ICS um, from our role? And you don't have to. Uh, first line of therapy now is uh, ICS. Um, along with Motorola, or, or at least ICS along. And this is a, a come back to step one here. We'll, we'll always use ICS and Motorola uh, as needed for patients with mild asthma. So um, moving up to step three, in patients, the preferred inhaler is ICS and Motorola, or the, the trademark name is, is Simbacort, right? It comes in two doses. So in um, patients who have require low dose uh, ICS and LABA regularly, you don't necessarily have to put them on Simbacort or if their insurance doesn't approve it, you could put them on um, uh, other ICS LABAs. But then for um, reliever therapy, use a SABA, use albuterol. Um, uh, don't mix the ICS LABAs together. Don't give them trade name of Advil or or Brio, and then give them uh, Simbacort as reliever therapy. So it's reiterating that budesonide for Motorola is the preferred reliever in patients with prescribed and maintenance therapy. For other ICS slabas, use Saba for reliever therapy. And here, so Simbacort, Simbacort, that's fine. If it's maintenance Brio, you know, you know they'll do this. Um, so yeah, uh, for a, a step three, budesonide for Motorola twice a day is fine. Uh, alternative is any ICS. Um, uh, if it's just an ICS, then you can use um, uh, Simbacort or ICS for Motorola as needed. And if it's ICS well, you can just use uh, albuterol. So uh, Gina mentioned maximum daily dose. Uh, for Motorol, um, uh, for um, uh, beclomethazone for Motorol uh, uh, inhalers, it's 48 micrograms. Um, for uh, budesonide for Motorol, it's 72. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, beclomethazone for Motorol that are available here, but I think it's a uh, boss air in the UK. Um, uh, but uh, to get to 72 micrograms, it's fairly high dose. One puff has 4.5. So to get to 72, you'd require 16 puffs a day. So it's not really an issue that I think uh, that's most patients. A uh, 28-year-old man is evaluated for a six-month history of episodic dyspnea, cough, and wheezing. As a child, he had asthma, but he has been asymptomatic since his early teens. He has his recent symptoms, which began after an upper respiratory tract infection, are often triggered by exercise or exposure to cold air, awake him from sleep once a week. On physical exam, vital signs are normal. There's scattered wheezing. Spirometry shows a PV1 of 75%, um, but predicted with 15% improvement after uh, albuterol inhaler. Uh, chest radiograph is normal. Which of the following is the most appropriate therapy for this patient? Thank you. Sal only, as you ICS, and long acting. Leukotriene was after everything. So, what category would he be? Uh, mild, moderate, or severe, or what step would you use in this thing? He has, he gets up from sleep once a week, so it's a three, right? So, so it's 
they'll see you in the answer. So yeah, um, nighttime awakenings with the field, DSF3, so ICS lava. Um, so in terms of the dosage, um, I have to look this up um, it, again, but um, medium dose, so um, low to medium dose going back here, low dose of budesonide, which is a common one used, it comes in 80 and 160 milligrams. So if you're giving them two puffs uh, in the morning and two puffs in the evening, so that's 160 and 160, that's 320. So they're, they're requiring um, a puff in the evening. They're already maxed out at their low dose. Um, so then they would require a medium dose after that. Um, amongst the medium dose, if you have them on 160 and they have two puffs in the morning and two puffs in the evening, so that's uh, 320 in the morning and 320 uh, um, in the evening, you're now already at 640. So a couple of more puffs and you're already past 800 uh, microgram dosing, in which case you would require high dosing um, or you'd be in the high dose category. And that automatically puts you at step five. So, um, it, it took, when I was doing the math, it, it's not a whole lot of puffs that takes for the patient from going all the way from requiring low dose all the way up to step five. Um, just a caveat that Gina says this is not a dose conversion chart. So a, um, a dose of fluticasone is not equivalent to 160 to 320 of, um, of citrosonide or, um, or budesonide. It's just the way that the, they've compiled the manufacturing inserts of what the low, medium, high dose is. So um, the two common ones that we use are, um, you know, some court comes in 80, uh, 4.5, and 100. Okay, so what's the role of leukotriene receptor uh, antagonists in the management of asthma? So we look here for step one and step two, they can be used um, um, as other alternative options if the patient can't tolerate uh, ICS or prefers not to take them. Um, they're not effective as ICS monotherapy in preventing a moderate asthma exacerbations. There's no biomarkers to guide use, and Gina uh, put in a uh, black box warning for neuropsychiatric effects. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind um, uh, for Gina's deputy patients. Um, if they have exercise induced bronchospasm or allergies or for airway disease, it may be a good medication. Um, and if the patient's on ICS lava low dose, you could add it on. Um, and if there's no improvement, so you could always stop it. But um, if the patient has underlying psychiatric disease, counsel them. There's a higher risk of um, suicidality and other psychiatric illnesses that can worsen with uh, uh, with leukotriene, especially Montelukast, which comes with the FDA box warning now. So when should I consider starting a patient on LAMA? Uh, do we do that frequently? Or? Um, so first step is always con confirmation of diagnosis and comorbidities, inhaler techniques, and adherence um, before we try to escalate up therapy. So uh, look back at inhaled medication delivery amongst meter dose inhalers, meter dose inhalers, and spacers. We have dry powder devices uh, and soft mist devices and nebulizers. Um, initially, I was going to go through the list of meter dose inhalers, but there's, when I started looking up, there's at least 10 trademark meter dose inhalers um, that I'm aware of, and each of them has a different technique in terms of utility. So this can get pretty difficult for every patient to, uh, to understand how to use their inhaler. So before we escalate therapy, always look to see if they're using their inhaler in the way it's uh, appropriate. And can you use any llama for asthma? Well, it kind of depends. If their insurance doesn't approve, uh, <laughs> then you have to use the one that's available. But um, only teotropium is approved by the FDA. Um, so um, it can be used up in, in, in step four um, before um, adding on biologics that should be considered. Uh, and so in step four and step five, uh, we could add on um, llama therapy. So uh, certain things about uh, Alama is that the, the dosage is a little different than the one that comes in for um, COPD. So traditionally, we're, we use the head inhaler for COPD. It comes in 18 mics. Um, this one here is actually um, also for COPD. 
um, it's 2.5, two puffs of it's five micrograms, uh, whereas um, 1.25 going up to 2.5 is approved for asthma. The five microgram dose is only approved for COPD. So 18 micrograms for COPD, 2.5 micrograms a day for asthma, five micrograms a day for COPD. They actually come in different color um, uh, inhalers. So the blue one is 1.25 mics per puff. Uh, that's approved for asthma, and then 2.5 mics per puff is um, up to 5 micrograms, it's approved for COPD. So this is a Respimat trademark, uh, soft mist inhaler. Um, also not the easiest one to use, um, and has a separate indication to, or a separate way of utilizing it compared to the um, to short acting beta agonist. So uh, caution while using Lama, so if a patient has glaucoma or urinary retention, um, Probably not use lama therapy, or at least counsel emergency to get worse um, or, uh, uh, before initiating this medication. And that was in the 2020 focus update for asthma management guidelines. Okay, long question. A uh, 72 year old woman with asthma, um, essential hypertension, open angle glaucoma, and hyperlipidemia is evaluated for gradual progressive wheezing, non productive cough, and chest tightness. In the past, she was very active, but in the past month or so, her respiratory symptoms have become severe enough that she has had to cancel her activities. She has noted that her eyeglass prescription has required updates uh, three times in the past year, and she has plans to undergo elective eye surgery next month. Her medication includes two puffs every 12 hours of combination of Advair, albuterol, as needed hydrochlorothiazide, Timolol, ophthalmic drops in each eye three times daily, and a torsal statin. Her FEV1 is reduced, FEC is 82% predicted, and she has obstruction. There was 22% improvement in expiratory airflow after administration of albuterol via nebulization. Physical exam shows mild expiratory wheezes, but is otherwise unremarkable. What's the next one? Oh. Okay. So the, uh, again, we went, um, Timolol uh, or beta blockers, non selective beta blockers, um, can occasionally, even as eye drops, can cause bronchial constriction. And there's things that uh, the thought is that non selective beta blockers, even as eye drops, they're the ones that are most responsible for it. The mechanism of action is not completely understood uh, as to why uh, just a few drops can cause bronchial spasm, um, uh, but it's something to consider um, uh, before a patient goes to glaucoma surgery. And there's, um, there's other um, uh, uh, beta blockers that are used as eye drops that don't traditionally do that. So. If the patient is using uh, Timolol more frequently and is having worsening asthma, this might be something to consider. Okay, so um, the last couple of minutes, I'll talk about treatment modalities for severe non-type 2 asthma. So about 30% of patients do not have type 2 inflammation, so they won't have high uh, sputum or blood acidophils if their genome won't be elevated, IG will not be elevated. Um, there's not a whole lot of medications that are approved for T2 specific low asthma. There are no biologics that are approved right now. Uh, we can consider macrolides, uh, bronchial thermoplasty, and oral corticosteroids, although these patients may not be terribly responsive to, to steroids. So um, going back into this review of type 2 um, inflammation of asthma, you see an eosinophil here. This is uh, an alveolar macrophage uh, here, usually between either 2 or 3 percent. Uh, peripheral eosinophilia would be consistent with airway inflammation and asthma. Uh, this is a neutrophil uh, alveolar macrophage again here. Um, so if it's neutrophil, it's predominant because over 60% is considered neutrophilic asthma. Um, this is a pseudocolmonic epithelial cell, um, and this is a ma alveolar macrophage that has eaten a bacteria. Uh, and here, this is eosinophils and neutrophils. So going over T2 high, usually there's aller they're allergic, allergic to have eosinophilia uh, peripherally or in the sputum, and their steroid response at T2 low are non-atopic uh, and usually are poorly steroid responsive. So in 2017, there was the AMAZES trial um, that looked at putting patients who are uncontrolled asthmatics on high dose ICS lava on azithromycin at 500 milligrams three times a week for 48 weeks, and they compared it to placebo. And they actually found that there was, there, the endpoints that they were looking at was severe exacerbation of asthma or uh, moderate exacerbation of asthma. And the way they defined those endpoints were either uh, an exacerbation leading to hospitalization, an ER visit where you would require three days of systemic steroids, 
um, or if you're on systemic steroids, if you're going up by 10 milligrams, um, or if you're hiding from like intubation. Um, uh, and then the moderate asthma that they looked at is that if you had to go up on your um, inhaler therapy uh, significantly and, and involving steroids, uh, that would be considered um, uh, a, a positive outcome as well. Uh, and they also looked at your um, asthma quality of life questionnaires. And the study was pretty impressive in the sense that um, they looked at both eosinophilic asthma and non-eosinophilic asthma, and it improved outcomes in both. Um, they also looked at like if there was bacteria negative or bacteria positive, and it worked in, in, in both of them as well. Um, they did exclude patients who are smokers, and if you're FEV1, I believe it was less than 70%, they excluded those patients. So, Gina reports that you can consider this for persistent symptomatic asthma patients despite being on high dose ICS and LAVA, and probably can be considered for both P2 and non P2 asthma based on the, um, the AMAZES trial. Uh, obviously, you've got to look for uh, ECG prolongation and Student for atypical mycobacteria, uh, mycobacteria prior to initiation. Uh, it can cause autotoxicity, so don't prescribe it in patients with hearing impairment. Um, treatment is suggested for at least six months um, because there was no difference seen at three months. So if you're going to start these patients on azithromycin, you're committed at least for six months. No clear benefit for three. And we don't know how long it should be continued. They continued it for 48 weeks um, uh, in the trial. And yeah, smoker than DLCU. Uh, uh, there's uncertain benefit because these patients were excluded from the trial. Lastly, bronchial thermoplasty. We're doing it here at Henry Ford as well. Um, it's physical modality that uses radio frequency ablation to reduce uh, smooth muscle mass. Uh, it's done over three sessions um, uh, with a trademark device. Uh, it may be considered an option in step five in uncontrolled asthma patients. It's usually only after optimized medical therapy and referral to a specialty center. Um, so one of the issues of the, the AIR-2 trial that, that was a pivotal trial that came out in 2010, um, they excluded patients with chronic sinus disease, chest infection, anyone with an FEV1 less than 60%, and there was a significant placebo effect. So they looked at um, the asthma quality of life uh, questionnaire, and there was a 74% improvement in the AIR-2, or the, the uh, BT patients, or bronchial thermoplasty patients, and a 64% improvement in the sham patients. They just they essentially just got a bronc. Um, and in the immediate aftermath, there's a higher risk of exacerbations of asthma. But as they looked at this over a period of time, uh, they showed that um, hospitalizations, uh, severe exacerbation, and emergency visits actually go down. Um, and there was a real world study that looked at these patients at three years as opposed to just one year. And they found that these. Um, Interventions actually hold through. So there's a reduction in severe exacerbations, ER visits go down, and hospitalizations go down. So it is a therapeutic modality that might be considered in patients who are still symptomatic um, uh, and they're, um, uh, they're on high dose uh, in health cortical steroids and lambos. Patients with biologics weren't involved in the ER2 trial. So um, a couple of things to, uh, to remember. Is that Optimize medical therapy before uh, referring these patients. FEV1 should be greater than 60%, and no history of chest disease or chronic sinus disease. Okay, um, takeaway points from Gina uh, confirmed diagnosis of asthma, consider bronchial palpitation test in clinically symptomatic patients with normal spiral gland. Pheno may be utilized in Agile, fairly cheap, may be used as point of care at some point in patients who can't undergo a spirometry. Uh, ICS promotoral uh, as needed for mild asthma. Uh, maintenance uh, and reliever therapy with ICS promoterol, uh, and if there's a patient on ICS lava, then use the short-acting beta agonist. Um, leukotriene receptor agonist is a black box for morning uh, for neuropsychiatric illnesses. If you're using uh, teotropium, use softness inhaler at 2.5 mics, um, and uh, uh, ask about urinary retention and glaucoma. Um, Azithromycin also may be considered in persistent asthmatic patients. If you are going to treat these patients at least for six months, the trial excluded smokers and patients with an FEV1 less than 70%. Um, and then uh, patients uh, who are uncontrolled um, 
uh, on optimal medical therapy may be considered for a bronchotrauma plasty, but uh, patients have to have an FDV1 of greater than 60%, or at least that's how the trial was done, and no uh, history of um, chronic sinus infusion. Um, uh, this is what uh, I had a video of how to use a Restimat inhaler from Natural Jewish Health, but we'll skip that. Those, any questions? Oh, yeah, we do. That's why I thought it was so hard. <clears throat> the volume's up. Right? The rest of that. The rest of is a device which releases medication as a slow moving head. It's going to use the rest of that for the very first time and will need to prepare a sign. To prime the rest of that, hold the cap in one hand and press the safety release. With the other hand, pull off the clear base. Now, write the discard date on the inhaler. This is three months from the date you prepare the device. Push the narrow part of the cartridge into the inhaler. The base of the cartridge will not sit flush with the inhaler. Put the clear plastic base back onto the inhaler. Now, hold the rest of that inhaler upright with the cap at the top and close. Turn the clear base in the direction of the white arrows for a half turn until it clicks. Open the cap. Point the inhaler towards the ground and release. Press the dose release button. Close the cap. Repeat this three more times. Now your inhaler is ready to use. When you are ready to take the medication, hold the rest of that up straight. Turn the clear base in the direction of the white arrows for a half turn until it clicks. Flip the cap until it snaps fully open. Next. Hold the rest of that away from your mouth and gently breathe out. Feel your lips around the mouthpiece without covering the air back. While inhaling slowly and deeply through your mouth, press the dose release button. Continue to breathe in slowly and deeply. Remove the rest of that from your mouth and hold your breath for as long as you can, up to 10 seconds. When done, close the cap until you use your inhaler again. Let me show you what this looks like. So you're going to turn the base until it clicks, open the cap, and see the light. And you can close the cap. The rest of that has a dose indicator on the side of the device. It will let you know how many doses are left. When the pointer enters the red area of the scale, there's enough medication for seven days. <clears throat> to clean the rest of that, do not put it in water. Simply wipe the mouthpiece, including the metal card inside the mouthpiece, with a damp cloth at least once a week. I thought it was a little hard. <laughs> Any questions?
Yeah, no, I, I, we just said in those guidelines that you mentioned, just going on. Um, I tried to look at, at least what they said. 